Hey, everybody. Let's uh, get this show on the road, shall we? So my background is actually engineering and finance, but to be honest, I've probably had more success over the years throwing parties than I have in engineering or in finance. We used to throw these solar-powered parties and tell people that music sounds better when it comes from the sun. <laughs> the funny part is that we actually learnt a lot from these parties, and we're now using that to try and solve something much bigger, how to transform our cities to become completely self-sufficient. Let me explain. A few years ago, we wrote this book called A New Normal on how to transform Melbourne to become the world's first self-sufficient city in terms of energy, water, and waste. A technical and financial strategy demonstrate how profitable, pragmatic, it is to basically transform Melbourne from a consumer to a producer. We demonstrated that it can be basically 100% renewable, water neutral, and zero waste, and it would basically um, uh, create a city that will never run out. We, we found that it would cost about $100 billion through 10 profitable initiatives and pay for itself in about seven years, all creating about 80,000 jobs. And as logical as all of that is, for me, the crazy part is that it would leave us with a city that will never run out. We created a full pathway to implementation and worked out who will pay for it and when. Turns out the private sector will pay for about 99% of it. Writing the book was the easy part, though, and trying to turn that into reality is the real challenge. And what's even more challenging is turning that into policy. So we presented the book to basically state government, and I think they thought I was insane. They basically said to me it was far too much risk for the government to try and implement that kind of policy. And to be fair, I was asking them to end all fossil fuels and end all waste to landfill by 2030. So they, I basically flipped it around and said, OK, what could we do to help try and remove that risk for the government? And they explained something that really stuck with me. They said, go build projects, basically. Make them profitable so it works for the private sector. Ensure you connect with people to try and gain public support and basically do everything you can to make it easier for a politician to turn that into policy, de-risk it for a politician. So naturally, we went back to the parties. <laughs> of all the things that we've done over the years, basically, it's the technical and financial stuff that puts people to sleep. But for some reason, people always hitting me up about these bloody solar-powered parties. We asked ourselves, what was it that people connected with so much? and realised that it wasn't solar and music, but technology and culture. So this became our new ethos, integrating the physical infrastructure that is required to transform our cities, basically technology, with the cultural infrastructure that enables us all to thrive. Basically, it was a way of trying to bring everyone together, the people, the private sector, and the public sector. So to get things moving, we invited 15 of Melbourne's best architects over to my living room in Fitzroy for a dinner. <laughs> and basically, what came from this night, I think, surprised us all. I quickly poured my heart out and shared about two years of calculations in about 15 minutes. And these legends all embraced what we had to say with open arms. And basically, in that moment, I saw our little insignificant book turn into something that had collective ownership. And really, this was a lesson we learned from the parties as well. Like, the atmosphere brought everyone together. The atmosphere was way more important than the information. These legend architects who, are like, they basically turned this $100 billion strategy into 15 tangible projects across the city that we could go and find sites and funds for to basically just get on with it. The pitch to the architects was poetry, encrypting tech with culture, just like the parties. So I'm going to quickly take you through these projects. So basically, it was electrifying the entire transport sector, all trains and all cars, electrifying and retrofitting all one million buildings in Melbourne, chucking solar panels on every second building in Melbourne, and converting our power plants to renewables, 
treating sewer water to provide an unlimited supply of water for the city, and transforming our suburbs to become a sponge for stormwater. Transforming food waste into energy and fertilizer, ending landfill, creating a completely circular city, and last but not least, helping all new buildings have a positive environmental impact by a much needed new building code. Each of the projects connected technology with culture to try and give the transition a feeling. And to be honest, these architects all completely inspired me and reminded me why I love architecture so much. Architecture is this incredible vessel for transformation and the construction industry can just be so constructive as long as it's headed in the right direction, of course. So as a way of getting on with it, we decided to take over this existing building in the city and basically build little baby versions of those 15 projects, prototypes, to show rather than tell. It was an exhibition of the future of the city and everyone was invited. We wanted everyone to connect with it, whether they understood or not, whether they cared or not. We invited developers, councils, investors, and much like an art gallery opening, the projects got the red dot when someone bought one. From temporary, we can create permanence, another thing we learned from the parties. Basically, people are tired of talking about this stuff. People want to see it, and they want to feel it. So we wrote to an electric car company and asked them if we could have two of their cars to power the event, and they said that's a hard no. <laughs> so we bought the batteries from their cars anyway and just did it ourselves. We wrote to the um, EPA and the Department of Health and asked if we could treat sewer water to, to serve it to people in cans and call it shit, yeah? <laughs> and they also said that's a hard no. <laughs> so instead we filmed people drinking recycled water in five different countries around the world and then made these things that my friend Mark called shit misters. My friend Claire created this installation which was basically a tea house to talk about the topic that we need to remove gas from all one million buildings in Melbourne. And people loved it and connected with it, whether they understood or not. It created curiosity and that was the goal. We wanted people to connect with the feeling rather than the facts. This was the first time for me personally that I felt like people actually understood what we were talking about and it was because people connected with the experience rather than the information. Basically, people wanted it whether or not it was good for the environment. We scored heaps of press out of this. We actually got a whole bunch of like, press internationally and locally, and that media gave the project substance. And basically, it went from this kind of wild idea to poetry in motion in a really short period of time, and it was as if all the people that we were knocking on their door and hitting them up to try and help us turned around and started knocking on our door. And the whole launch went way better than we expected. We actually got, in one week, we got eight projects funded and 200 mil worth of projects across the city, so eight of the 15. <laughs> so three years since that dinner, uh, three of those projects are now built, two are in construction, and the rest are in planning. And so I'm going to take you through a few of these examples. Basically, a factory to electrify 1.3 million cars in Melbourne, and my combi van, for example, is going to go in there and get electrified by the end of the year. Um, we need to retrofit 1 million buildings in Melbourne, which sounds complicated, right? So we just started with one. It's Australia's first plus energy retrofit of an apartment building. It will generate more energy than it consumes on an annual basis. And it might look simple, well, the reality is it is. It's the sum total of a bunch of boring things that create something radical. This building is targeting zero bills, it will be zero carbon in operations, and it was 88% less embodied emissions than building something new. The residents have just moved in and we're pretty excited about it, so it's just been completed a month ago 
but also we're starting to build some momentum in a political way as well. This is Homes Victoria, the State Government Housing Department checking out the project and the Minister for Planning, so we're warming up policy to this idea too. We need 150 anaerobic digesters in Melbourne to treat all of the food waste. So we're getting started with one. It's a waste to energy plant in the basement of an office building. It will suck food waste from 340 restaurants in the neighbourhood via e-bikes, and it will turn that food waste into energy and fertiliser, generating four times more energy than the building consumes. And the fun part is that it will send heat to a rooftop sauna so people can feel the technology. <laughs> And this is the idea. We want to ensure that people love the technology. We want to make it easier for people to replicate and we want to make it easier for it to become policy. These are the gizmos in an anaerobic digester. <laughs> we need a new net zero building code. So instead of talking about it, we're just going to go build it. Um, it's a physical example of what the new building code could feel like. Our goal is to try and make it easier for developers to deliver this at scale and trying to make it easier for councils to push for stronger environmental standards. And there's actually a whole bunch more in the pipeline that I can't tell you about right now, but basically there's like all kinds of fun things going on. Now, you might look at this and go, well, cool, dude, you're building a couple of projects and you've built a couple of projects, what's the point and how does that become policy? Well, I can't say that we've got it solved for everything but I'll give you one example of how some of our projects are becoming policy. We've started working with the CFMEU, the Builders Workers Unions, and we're basically working together with them now to retrofit their buildings. We're taking the plumbers and gas fitters building off gas together with them. We're working with the CFMEU to do a plus energy retrofit of the union buildings to try and inform policy and go lobby government to retrofit all buildings in Melbourne. Much like the green bans and heritage policy, the unions are about to start to fight for the environment. When I took my friends from the unions there, they said to me, hey, dude, now we get what you're talking about with all those numbers and graphs. We needed to see it, we needed to feel it. And that was the idea. Basically, this process has become way more, was way more effective than any of us realised. Some of our projects are getting close to becoming policy, and that wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't built those projects. And those projects wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't tried to connect them with people and create a feeling. For me, it's inevitable that our cities are transforming. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and what we all did to help speed it up. People are often asking me what they can personally do to help speed things up. And my answer would be this. It doesn't matter if you're an individual, if you're a business or if you're in politics, there's a party going on in every city around the world, and you're all invited. Don't sit at home and complain about it. Rock up, get involved, bring people together, and have a good time. Thanks very much. I'll see you there. <laughs>